and welcome to today's webcast sponsored by Liberty Mutual, where we're going to discuss the role of insurance in the future of ESG. I'm John Davies, Senior Vice President and Analyst at GreenBiz, and I'm pleased as always to welcome listeners from around the world. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. The screen you're looking at has a number of features that I'll point out. As the slide shows, as the slide on your screen shows, you can resize and move around the various windows on the webcast platform to optimize your viewing experience. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. On the bottom of your screen, there's a toolbar with various buttons. You can download the resources from today's webcast by clicking on the button marked resources. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and the recording will be shared with all registrants later today. If you have questions for today's speakers, simply click on the Q&A button and type your questions into the Q&A window that appears. We'll be fielding those later on in this program, but don't hesitate to ask along the way. And finally, feel free to share what you're learning with your Twitter network by using the hashtag GRNBZ. That's green biz without the vowels. And now on to today's discussion. While most people may not think of insurance as a key player in advancing ESG journeys, the industry plays a very important role in helping solve some of the most pressing environmental and social issues facing the world today. In this hour long webcast, you'll hear from subject matter experts across Liberty Mutual about the important role that insurance plays in ESG, especially in the environmental space, and how companies might partner with their insurance carriers to help advance their own ESG journeys. So joining me today are Rob Marsh, President of Liberty Mutual Canada, Rocky Kumar, Senior Vice President of Sustainability Solutions at Liberty Mutual, and Kelly Harride, Director of Catastrophe R&D at Liberty Mutual. And just one quick note for anyone, for everyone. We're not going to be presenting any slides until the very end where we talk about the resources. So you may want to maximize the media player window to better see uh, all of our speakers. All right, now before we dive too deep into today's conversation, which is going to focus on the environmental and climate aspects of ESG. I'm wondering, Rocky, if you could talk briefly about the important role insurance can play advancing ESG and how Liberty Mutual approaches ESG overall. Yeah, thanks, John. And hello, everyone. It's great to be here. So, John, we see insurance. I mean, at the core, insurance is really a, a socially responsible product. It's integral to our financial system, but also for economic security. And at Liberty, we believe that progress happens when people feel secure. And that's what we offer. We offer security by mitigating risk and also by helping people get back on their feet after a loss event. Um, and given that role that, in, that ESG plays for and how it connects to insurance, um, we identified our ESG or articulated our ESG ambition as advancing resiliency and inclusive growth. Um, underpinning that ambition is a very uh, are four pillars uh, of activities or uh, focus areas for us uh, around ESG, and one of them is ensuring our customers or increasing customer resiliency, enabling sustainable growth and integrating ESG into our decision making and day to day activities improving lives and communities, and then lastly, advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's how we are, we've set up the approach to ESG at Liberty. Great, well, now let's, let's get into the, the topic we came here to discuss. Kelly, um, you probably have one of the coolest titles, Director of Catastrophe R&D, and, and so I'm, I'm really excited about our conversation today. So as Rocky pointed out, ESG is, is integral to the insurance industry. Um, and, you know, Liberty Mutual is an expert in managing and mitigating risks, uh, especially those that relate to natural hazards. So how has the growing concerns of climate change affected how you model and project risks? 
Yeah, so um, just a little background on me. I'm a climate scientist who's actually been working in insurance for the last decade or so. And so I get to see kind of both sides of the coin. I get to see risk and I get to see the science. And one thing that I think doesn't always get sort of widely appreciated is that we could emit not one more molecule of CO2 starting tomorrow, and we would still be living with the impacts of our climate decisions that have been made up to this point for decades and in some cases centuries in the future. So it's not a choice between climate mitigation and climate adaptation. We have to be doing both of those things at the same time. And that climate adaptation is where uh, partners like Liberty Mutual can really have uh, an important role to do that forward-looking risk mitigation. And the reason why insurers in particular are really well-suited to managing physical disasters or physical risks is that we have these tools called catastrophe models that we've been using for decades to explore what, not just what has happened in the past, but what could happen in the biggest, meanest natural hazards that we have to deal with as a society. Hurricanes, floods, wildfires, you name it, we probably have a model that will do it. This means that we have a unique set of tools in the toolbox to be able to take apart this thorny problem because we don't really experience climate change as I have experienced an increase of one degree C in temperature. What you experience is a change in the frequencies of disasters. That's how our society actually feels climate change. Now, that being said, catastrophe models are not sort of the be all and end all tool because you can only get so much of a forward look. So that's where we have to partner with what's happening in the scientific community in climate models. So climate models have a variety of strengths and weaknesses. Their strength is that they allow us to look forward in time as to what could happen in potential futures as we continue to emit carbon into our atmosphere and see sort of the downstream impacts of that. The downside is that they struggle to met or struggle to represent the sorts of complex extremes that affect us the most in our society and in, our, in the insurance industry. So things like hurricanes and wildfires are, are really poorly handled by those models. So that's where it's really helpful to have people like me, and this is something that Liberty is really investing in, is having people who can serve as climate translators. So they're scientists who can take advantage of all of this big ferment of interesting research that's happening and put it down at a scale that it is relevant to the decisions that are being made in the business. Respecting the uncertainty on what potentially could come, but being able to bring it down to the level of strategy and down to the level of risk in individual portfolios to help the business make better decisions to mitigate our risk. That, that is great. And we have some questions coming in about some tools and things we'll get to a little bit later. But Rocky, talking about climate risk and, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how companies should disclose those. You know, there's TCFD and there's other other frameworks. Given the limitation of the tools and technologies currently available, what are some of the challenges from a reporting standpoint? Yeah, and I think um, here I'm going to go into what is the purpose of reporting? Is Are we doing reporting for reporting's sake? Are we doing reporting for uh, how are we using that information? And I'm going to just expand a few things that Kelly talked about and focus on the infrastructure problem that impacts reporting, as well as the approach that can really make reporting more meaningful. Um, so the first one, we've talked about models and tools. Um, when we were looking at reporting, your answers and your reporting in terms of your numbers and anything quantitative is significantly impacted based on the model you use, the tool you use. So you may be trying to do the same exercise, but your results will be different based on the vendor you've chosen. And that means that the numbers that are currently being put out are not apples to apples. As much as we think they are, because there's a framework that may be common, the numbers are not. And um, that impacts uh, usability as well as comparability. So that's the first thing I'd like to point out. The second bit is data availability. Um, you know, um, TCFD asks you to do scenario assessments and uh, stress test your portfolios. Liberty has just done that exercise. Um, and the data coverage to actually evaluate, say, your investment portfolio at 
in a in a uh, I would say at, at the optimistic level would cover about forty to sixty percent of your portfolio, and I, I'm being optimistic, overly optimistic. So that just tells you that you're not getting the full picture of your portfolio, etc. And the last bit is that on um, at least when it comes to climate, how we're addressing it. It's uh, everybody is talking about doing stress tests for thirty. 50 year time horizons. And uh, when you think of how we are managing business and portfolios, it's uh, typically it's 5, 10, 15 year time horizons, you're rebalancing actively, et cetera. Um, asking someone to do a stress test and see how your portfolio, which it is using a static model that cannot be dynamically adjusted based on your decisions you'd like to make, um, means that you're asking somebody, it's like, I liken it to somebody. Um, in 1970, using a model to predict what their profits or impact was going to be in 2000 and 2020, and actually make business decisions today for that world that the model is telling you to do. And so at Liberty, what we've we've decided to do is really look at the horizon scanning, look at the, those long-term time horizons of 30 to 50 years as horizon scanning exercises. It's important to understand what trends are there and what may happen from a macroeconomic perspective, but really focus stress tests, et cetera, on the 5, 10, 15 year horizon. Great. So uh, keep sending in questions, folks. We're going to get to those. And, and I know some of them address what we're just talking about here. But I want to switch to sort of the, the underwriting part of the business. So, Rob, can you talk about how impacts of climate change affect the work you're doing in terms of underwriting? Yeah, absolutely, John. You know, thank you. I, you know, I think, Larry, the, the increasing impacts of climate change really are going to have one of, if not the most significant impacts to underwriting results and approach in the coming years uh, and decades. And so it's really important that we're looking into a whole host of uh, items that are impacting our approach. And, you know, I'll narrow it down to a few specifics. And, and Kelly and Rocky have already alluded to a few of these. And, and the first being pricing models, right? I mean, generally speaking, our industry does tend to price risk based on historical data. And using the past to predict the future just isn't going to work um, in the way that it used to. Climate change has really turned models on their head, whether events from the past, um, you know, that perhaps happen every 25 to 50 years are certainly happening every few years now. And so I think those events, even in addition to that, were perhaps never deemed plausible, are also becoming all too real. So our job relative to our modeling perspective is to really measure and price risk in a better way, which re really leads me to maybe a second point that I want to make around tools and technology. And, and again, our tools that we've utilized from an underwriting approach um, need to be adapted quite significantly. And, and at Liberty, we're certainly investing in a variety of those tools and software so that we can better analyze uh, our risk exposure, predict in a way that's not only going to price it appropriately, but what's really important is around creating that support and consistency for our customers, our brokers and clients. And so even with this significant and ongoing investment, there's certainly no guarantees, right? I mean, the complexity and opportunity in our business is around that unpredictability. But in many areas, uh, technology is also playing that catch up as part of it. So certain perils such as earthquake or wind or hurricane have been modeled for many years. And although that's evolving and we'll continue to update them, there's significant science that is there to support those models and management of risk. Other perils such as wildfire, for example, may not have been as focused as heavily in the past. And so we're seeing the need for that improvement in some of those models to better predict current and future exposures. And that'll probably lead me to a third item that's worth commenting on, which is around risk engineering and risk services. So as many of you may know, it's not uncommon for insurance companies to have engineers review physical risks as part of the underwriting process. In fact, a number of insurers like Liberty, this is often critical to ensure that we're pricing and managing risk effectively. And so that process is even that much more important to engage risk engineering and risk services in a different way, again, not just on pricing of our risk and risk selection, but as a valuable service to our clients to really help provide recommendations that helps protect property in the face of climate change. And, you know, two more points that I just make to finish your question, John, is that often we're talking about property 
right? Because that comes uh, first and foremost when you think about climate change. But it's not the only risk that we're managing uh, through climate change or climate resiliency. You know, as an industry, we've also seen a rise in climate change litigation on the liability front. So where government or corporations are being targeted as contributors to climate change, or perhaps being sued for not doing enough to mitigate or respond to climate change. And so these are some interesting developments that will continue to follow and continue to hear more and learn more as we look at those linkage between uh, climate and liability. And lastly, I think I'd just also like to comment that, you know, broadly speaking, it's just making a huge impact on underwriting decision making. So challenges and opportunities there, right? On the challenge front, there's some risks that will be too risky or much more challenged to insure. Florida's coastal home insurance situation, for example, companies have had to make difficult underwriting decisions based on increased risk. On the opportunity front, there are many innovative solutions being developed to help us live and work in a more environmentally friendly way. And this is really where insurers can and should be at the forefront of a lot of these new technologies to enable and be much more risk aware on our outlook for appetite and evolving risk. All right. Well, <clears throat> you've been, <clears throat> excuse me, Rob, you've been talking a lot about risk and that's all the really scary, scary stuff. But you know, Kelly, I'm going to turn to you and say, you know, you must work on some other things that don't scare you as much. So where where do we fall on the opposite side on the resilience, climate resiliency, and where is insurance's role in, in fostering more climate resiliency? Yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a climate scientist who works every day on disasters in an insurance company. I'm basically a professional bummer. So that means I have to be thinking about the resiliency side and what we can do to proactively mitigate our risk in order to be able to sleep at night. So, you know, again, this is a situation where we don't really have the option to just do one thing or another, just reduce emissions or just adapt. We essentially have to walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, there's a, a, a famous climate scientist who describes what happens with completely unmitigated climate change. Um, he describes it as it's like trying to run a model and seeing what happens if you jump off a cliff and see what happens at the bottom. If that model says that you're gonna be fine, that just means you have a bad model. So this means that, you know, while we tend to think of insurance as someone who comes in after a disaster to help put a community back together, and that's a really important role and sort of the societal role that insurance plays, it means that we're in a really unique position to be able to understand how to reduce that risk at the front end. And that's where the resilience question comes into play. This can happen really at a, a variety of both time and spatial scales, meaning anything from investing in sort of community scale defenses where we can be work doing public private partnerships to partner with communities and discuss like, hey, here is where you know investments in your stormwater infrastructure or your levees or forest management is not going to just reduce risk for a building, but instead for an entire community. If we can work out ways to communicate and tell that story, that's how we can spread resilience at a larger scale. But really importantly, and this is this is an area where you know insurance has has had a voice for a long time, and it only is getting more important as our climate-related risks are increasing and in many cases accelerating, is the role of building codes. So uh, the National Institute of Building Science has done some studies arguing that. Uh, Incorporating the latest building code requirements, every dollar invested in doing that produces an $11 return in the form of reduced risk down the line, right? There, you can hardly make a better investment uh, if you, even if you were, there's almost nothing else that offers that level of return. And it's really important to keep this in mind because what the decisions that we make about our building codes and our building stock today reverberate for decades into the future. So, you know, I can come in here and say, yeah, you know, investing in building code saves a lot of money and that's true and that's important. But it also affects how people's lives will be lived out in this environment of changing risks. And there was a really great example of that happening recently with the Marshall Fire, which happened in Colorado a few months ago, the most destructive wildfire in Colorado history. It destroyed more than a thousand homes and businesses. This wildfire happened during this incredible high wind event, which is very normal for that area of Colorado, more than 100 mile an hour winds. 
What was less normal is that it was so warm and dry that there was no snow on the ground. So again, we're thinking about how climate ties into every one of the hazards that we work with. Now, in the communities that were affected, there were actually two neighborhoods that were sitting side by side. One of those neighborhoods had been built largely in the 60s and 70s using the building codes that were the standard at that time. Every single one of those homes burned to the ground. Every single one was lost. But there was a second neighborhood that was so close, it was literally across the street. And it was built using new fire-resistant building codes, fire-resistant siding, fire-resistant roofs. Every single one of those buildings survived. Even though they were literally so close, they literally had melted pieces of their neighbor's homes stuck to the side of their homes. Wood siding would have burned every one of those houses down and every single home survived. Those are the decisions that we are making today in our building codes that are determining how we will experience this increase in hazard. There are some increases in hazard that are gonna happen no matter what we do. Sea level rise will continue to increase for centuries. Our temperatures are going to be elevated for decades. But those are natural hazards. What turns them into disasters is how we respond in our built environment. And that's where insurers need to have a loud voice. John, can I jump in and add something here? Please do, so, Rocky. So, you know, uh, I, I also want to bring out the importance of resiliency from a systemic risk level, right? So, and, and I think Kelly talked about it, but I want to talk about how important it is for the insurance industry. For us as insurers, accessibility and affordability are two key aspects of our business. We need, we need insurance to be accessible and affordable. When you look at systemic risk, systemic, I mean, or resiliency, and, and she talked about how you can make communities more resilient, you're actually reducing risk in the system, right? The building codes she talked about. That keeps insurance accessible and affordable. In the absence of that kind of resiliency, you'll have either insurers pulling away or insurance becoming way too expensive for, uh, so, so it's important for the viability of a market that we do lean into resiliency as a sector. That's a great point. So I'm going to, uh, you know, our, our, our uh, audience is mostly businesses and that, and, and I think a big thing, we've talked a little bit about TCFD and they talk about climate transition risks that get this disclosed. So um, what we haven't really talked about in terms of that is the transition to a low carbon economy and Rocky, I know your team just did some research around this. So, so what are the sort of mega or macro trends that you're seeing from a policy landscape when it comes to transition scenarios? Yeah. So, John, as I mentioned, that you know our approach really was in the 30, 50 year time horizon. We we want to just horizon scan, and part of that led to us. Uh, we just finished our scenario exercise. It's all in our TCFD report, but. What we did was two different exercises. The first exercise was taking these models and we used, I think there's a question about what tools did you use or what models did you use? We used G the NGFS or the Network for Greening of the Financial System. This is a group that of central bankers and NGOs that have, have come together and developed um, these transition models that are focused on for the, or designed for the financial sector. And so we use the NGFS models, it's open source and the, the first, the system-wide or macro exercise that we did was, let's see what these models and what's the data in these models telling us. So we actually unpack the um, models. You can do that because it's open source. Many of the vendors are closed box. You know, they, 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 they don't tell you what's in the model. You use the output more, uh, more so. So that's the first thing we did. And um, the second part of the exercise was a portfolio stress test. So I talked about we, we stress test our um, investment portfolio and, I, uh, and uh, the insights from that too. But I'm going to really focus on the macro insights that we got from the exercise. So the TCFD dis defines the source or, um, the, of transition risk as that stemming from policy change market or economic change, technology change, and reputational risk. What we found is that the biggest risk, immediate short-term risk facing companies is that from the policy aspect of 
transition risk. So the fact that you have very quickly changing policy that, and you need to respond to that, that's changing market. We all know that policy change eventually impacts market and drives market change, but that takes time. And so the models show that in the immediate future or the near future, the five to 10 year horizon, you're not gonna see big disruptions today, but there's something that will start showing up slowly as policy takes into uh, effect. And then the last aspect is technology change. And on technology change, again, it's not showing any immediate, and I mean short-term immediate change. However, technology is an area where you, you, it offers opportunity, te potential te technological change, and you can, where can you decide, or where should you play in it? Going back to policy, if policy is the biggest risk facing companies, what the models also show that um, while the world is pushing for common action, you have cops and you know everybody wants to move in a, in a lockstep, policy is probably not going to move lockstep. And that's because if you think about it, Europe has made a commitment to go to net zero by 2050, China by 2060, India by 2070, which means their policy is going to be timed at different to to achieve different objectives at different time different time horizons so we need to step back and say is it commonality that you need or is it coordination and what we found in the models that it's actually coordinated action that reduces negative macroeconomic impact or, or gdp impact and then when you think about policy the other interesting aspect is your how your your policy design is going to be depend is going to be influenced by how energy dependent your economy is and how energy intensive your economy is. So that's, I mean, we have really had the war right now that has brought all these insights uh, into, uh, you know, it's really into the forefront. But these insights really tell us that um, you can't change tomorrow. You're going to have to change in a very interesting like way. And you've got to be very thoughtful about your own energy demand and every country is going to be managing its security and transition risk. That also means that companies are going to be extremely challenged when they're making their own commitments and managing their own commitments because what does it mean if you make a net zero 2050 commitment? Does it mean you're going to either pull out of Asia because Asia has not moved? Are you going to drop your customers and create even more transition risk in the marketplace? And what about just transition? So those are some of the challenges and insights that we got from the exercise. That's great. I wish I wish it was just your research that's making everyone think about the energy transition risks and not the other events going on. Uh, but Rob, I'll, I'll stick with uh, talking about corporations and companies and get a little more gran granular. You know, maybe you can help expand on how you know, new technologies and also the risks we've been talking about due to climate transition may be affecting decision making for companies. Yeah, absolutely, John. You know, I think Rocky used the word thoughtful, and it's a really key piece in a complex challenge. You think about whether you're an energy producer or a consumer, you know, this transition is happening. And so it's about the belief that insurers play a really key role in helping companies adapt and manage through it. You know, I'll give the example that we've actually seen a number of insurers walk away from writing oil and gas risks, for example, whether in Canada or globally. And ultimately, uh, we simply don't win alone here from that. No one does. In order to appropriately transition to a low carbon society, I really believe, and, and certainly my colleagues believe, that insurers need to lean in, not step back and partner closely with both traditional and renewable energy companies to navigate the transition. You know, you look at many of the larger energy companies around the world, many fully recognize the importance of this energy transition and the need to adopt business models and practices for the future. You know, in many cases, these firms are some of the ones that have been leading the way on renewable energy, driving climate innovations, such as carbon sequestration technologies, for example. And, you know, we really work hard to identify which clients are all in on that ESG journey. And we do our best, certainly, to work with them to support the sustainability of that transition, as opposed to walking away or, or bowing to public pressures, uh, which may not always have the opportunity to be fully educated on the work that's happening 
to a low carbon future. And, you know, when I think about how important it is now more than ever to really leverage responsible internal risk management processes and, and our jobs as underwriters is to uh, be better risk selectors often than our, than our competitors. And so a big part of that is aligning what our customers ESG priorities are to make sure that we have the information that we need to make those right decisions. And as with any major transition and Rocky alluded to this as well, there, there's an abundance of opportunities that we need to take necessary steps. And as Kelly's talked about today too, on mitigating risk. And, you know, I think it's probably important to note that the commitment that Liberty has, for example, the energy transition, enabling that transition to a low carbon economy um, in addition to that underwriting and risk services approach I spoke about earlier, it's actually really, we're spending a ton of time integrating those ESG factors and data into our investment and underwriting process so that we identify the most material effects of, those, of that transition across our assets. Because you know, we, we absolutely acknowledge, and Rocky mentioned this, that need for continued energy stability and affordability now more than ever after the last few months and how the energy transition needs to be gradual, but not slow. Um, and so a lot of what we spend our time doing is ensuring that we're, we're, we're indeed aggressively pursuing, but at the same time, not walking away from energy business entirely, certainly the opposite, supporting uh, expertise and, and our stability and risk management that we provide. And I'll say as, you know, kind of to maybe conclude on your question, John, that. Leaning in is not always easy, right? For several reasons, and I'm sure many on this call uh, recognize that or, or, or face that. I mean, new technologies and emerging risks are innately more difficult to underwrite as we don't have the history or experience that we may have had in other areas. But at the same time, we see it as an obligation and, and, and we take that position seriously that this is a really positive area that, um, that we need to advance in. And I'll just give you an example. You know, solar, pan or solar panels are clearly a good investment for the environment, something that we want to support. They come with uh, some challenges from an underwriting standpoint, right? At a basic level, you could think that a process of installing a solar panel on a roof of a home, this may require structural updates or change to the type of roofing or increased electrical load or upgrades. Of course, these solar panels are often susceptible to wind and hail and installation could also be hazardous in terms of working from heights and with electricity. So it's our job as underwriters to really uh, come to the table, as I said, lean in um, and regularly stay on top of new and emerging technology to ensure that we're able to underwrite that risk, again, being risk aware and really supportive for our customers. That's great. And, you know, one last uh, area before we open it up for Q&A. So, so please keep sending in your questions. We've got a lot of really great ones so far. Um, you know, is just what what is the role of collaboration? You know, it's uh, number 17 on the SDGs, you know. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the opportunities and needs for insurance carriers and their policyholders, especially companies in advancing their ESG journeys together? Rob? Sure, yeah, John, happy to comment on that. You know, I think the collaboration is really important. Maybe we'll break it down into a few different stakeholders. So let's look at uh, maybe client. So I, I can't speak for all carriers, certainly, but when I speak for Liberty, I can say that we're not in the business of just selling insurance products. Uh, we're in the business of certainly selling risk-based solutions um, and collaborating with our brokers and clients to find those creative solutions. So. We've built our business on collaboration of client centricity, and it's moments like this one where we're really seeing the value in that approach. And when you, as insurance companies, we have one of the broadest views of the global economy, right? Deep expertise across a, a myriad of industries. And as a result, we have that understanding of associated risks and inherent issues that we can help solve. So this positions us really well from an advisory perspective. And we're there for our clients as trusted advisors in advance of loss helping them understand their risks and exposures. And we're, there, we're here for them when that loss occurs. And so from an advisory perspective, risk services is one of the biggest strengths and value add offerings that we have. So again, when we look at the ESG journey, uh, we have a, a ton of risk services offerings that are advancing and are developing to further support ESG, just like they've, 
uh, supported risk in the past. And I've spoken about the need that we really need to promote collaboration and partnership between policyholders, brokers, and underwriters as we advance that uh, transition. You know, and it's a bit of a client, but you talk about brokers specifically stepping back and really carriers and brokers are on this journey together. That's for the benefit of our mutual clients. We're, we're leveraging a lot of partnerships with some of our key broker partners. And maybe in a few examples that this group might be interested in, uh, you know, more recently, we have a climate transition pathway framework that we've built uh, through our, uh, our European offices, for example, where we were the first major insurer to support the CTP climate transition accreditation framework, which was developed one of our, uh, by one of our global partners, WTW, and performed by CDP worldwide. That's one. We've got another example where we've partnered with uh, our global partner, Marsh, to offer ESG-related risk advisory services that's actually tailored to our clients' needs based on ESG risk rating assessment. And, you know, this collaboration really shows our commitment to supporting clients on their sustainability journey, but it also provides us a better understanding of our clients' needs. And as we learn more, this leads to us building and enhancing our product and service offerings. So just two examples, but there's many others. And, and again, that collaboration and partnership is, is fundamental as we can do to work forward to success. Maybe lastly, in terms of stakeholders, let's talk about government, right? Because insurers have vested an interest in driving climate-related policy. I mean, we're, we're invested in that. After all, we're the ones who are going to have to pay for those increased claims as a result of climate-related losses. And one of the hottest issues at Liberty that's been, we've been really making a lot of progress about is climate resilience. We've talked a bit about that today. And one example is in uh, the U.S. of how we've been encouraging members of U.S. Congress to focus more on strengthening our residential and commercial infrastructure before a severe weather event strikes, instead of only focus on rebuilding. And so over the last year, we've actually advocated for legislation that doubles the amount of money the U.S. Congress allocates to pre-disaster mitigation and creates a $5 billion grant program to improve electric grid re resiliency. I mean, that partnership is really important. We work closely with our colleagues such as Rocky and others in our Office of Sustainability on some of our climate reporting to help in the goal to reduce emissions and obviously public policy and government is taking a big need there. And we're really working to include helping policymakers understand how the insurance industry assesses, incorporates and mitigates climate risk. And lastly, John, I'll just make a point about the role of values in all of this, because I think as an environmentally and socially focused insurer, it's important when you asked about collaboration that we partner as much as possible, both with supporting new and existing clients on this transition to be more sustainable. Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of at Liberty is our unique position as a mutual insurer. So unlike most of our global competitors, we, we don't have as many competing stakeholder demands that may sometimes drive behaviors or strategies that focus on short-term returns or earnings as opposed to long-term strategies or sustainability. And our values in that role that we play as a core facilitator for social good and a number one priority, uh, focus on financial performance certainly, but also being able to drive these goals and promises that we've spoken about today of policyholders continues to become really important. So I want to stay on that collaboration uh, um topic just a, one question that came in that i think is interesting is and and i'll start with you rob but the others can join in is there data that you'd like to have from organizations from companies that would help better manage future risk and your underwriting activities you know, we often joke as an insurer, you can never have enough data. And so the short answer, John, is there there are a lot of factors. And actually, we've spent a lot of time over the last two years developing both externally and internally what those data sources are. Um, and I, I would say, you know, generally speaking, some of the items and, and whether they're outlined in TDFB or otherwise, you know, you look at emissions efficiency, even just for example, across all of the industries that we work with. The ability to track emissions efficiencies around the world across industry is not easy, right? You look at some of that data to actually be able to pull and create more dynamic ways for us to underwrite through the business and steer portfolio is just one example. Um, but generally speaking, and I commented on this on the partnership of ESG, it really is the factors that 
uh, that we view as most important in ESG underwriting, um, there's many data points within that bailiwick and that basket that we're, we're working closely with partners to produce. So uh, it's a long list. I will say, though, uh, we're, we're seeing good traction, and I think our customers are seeing the importance of this just like anyone else. Um, and so it's getting easier both from a, a voluntary or, 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 or more push for reporting. And Rocky can probably comment on a couple of those areas as well. Well, I would jump in, sorry to jump in here and add that it's not just on the emission side too, right? It's also on the impact side. Um, I, don't, I don't know about the folks in the audience on our call, but I feel like I get a, a new climate tech startup pitch about every other day on someone who is promising to solve all of our climate data related problems. There is something of the wild west out there right now in climate data analytics and the value add for many of those is is relatively low so this is where liberty has seen that this you know ecosystem exists and recognize that they they're trying to fill an unmet need in the marketplace which is producing granular detailed forward-looking views of risk that are scientifically defensible that are reasonable and that are actionable Recognizing that this gap exists, we actually did a partnership with NOAA uh, last year where we ran a half-day workshop to sort of educate not only our peers in the industry, but also regulators and uh, other parts of and others in the public and private sector so that they could understand where this disconnect exists between sort of current level risk tools and what's happening that's forward-looking. So I think there are some real opportunities here for our industry to highlight where there are known gaps in the market. And we are actively investing with partner companies that we believe are doing the right thing on climate data analytics, developing our own in-house climate data analytics, as well as highlighting places where there really could be improvements um, and not just sort of accepting the marketplace as it stands today. One other point on that, though, is you can't just sort of hope that an external data source will solve your climate related problems. If you don't understand in ultra granular detail, your own book of business. So this is an area where part of our climate strategy is actually investing in more detailed understanding of our own book of business, where we're investing in machine learning and aerial imagery to get ultra granular insights on the book of business that we're writing today, because that is essentially table stakes for managing our fastest changing, high resolution climate driven hazards, things like flood and wildfire that vary a ton on really small spatial scales. So we wanna make sure that we're bringing the best available data and analytics to the table. And that's something that our large business clients can be thinking about as well. Like how do you make sure that you absolutely understand every part of your supply chain, every part of your operations, where they're located and what their greatest risk can potentially be. That is great. So we have so many great questions coming in. Rocky, I want to I want to turn to you and see, um, you know, until very recently, I would say, because I work with a lot of large companies, you know, sustainability folks and risk management folks sort of existed at different ends of the building, you know, and uh, they're only now sort of introducing themselves and shaking hands. So do you have any advice for the sustainability folks in our audience and maybe for the, the risk management folks as to how to have that conversation productively, you know, and, and you know, because sustainability is very long-term focused and risk management in some companies can be very short horizon. So how do they bridge that gap and have a good conversation to, to get to some solutions? Yeah, that's great. And, you know, at Liberty, we really focused at on governance and setting up the right governance structure. So um, the tone at the top was important, but the tone at the top doesn't mean saying the, C the CEO saying that ESG is important. We actually created a board um, governance structure, a, a separate um, committee of the board. But internally to get things moving, we created something in, on climate as well as ESG. But on let me talk about climate because I chair the council, we created something called a climate council. This climate council brings people like Kelly, 
and others in the organization from the businesses as well as investment side and different functions like finance and compliance and legal who come together and talk about climate, climate issues, emerging risks, uh, what, 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 where, what are the activities going on within different businesses every other week. So last year, for example, we met 22 times. That's a big commitment and a big resource, but that conversation has allowed us to go much faster than uh, and in a more coordinated manner. Um, and I think Kelly and I probably are on a call at least three times a week. So we're kind of joined at the hip in some ways. So you really have to lean in. You really have to um, create that governance structure and you really need to be at it. And initially, more than less to, in order to build that trust. To, and we did all of this during COVID, by the way. So it's all virtual. I think I met Kelly for the first time last week. But, uh, you know, that's an example of uh, how much dedication and resources it actually does take uh, to get this moving. Kelly, and I think that also has allowed us, by having this sort of, you know, cross-functional meeting, it's allowed us to help identify opportunities and co-benefits within the business. So, for example, you know, Rob was talking earlier about risk engineering. If we can be thinking about how our physical risks may potentially be changing and send risk engineers proactively to areas that we think may be at maybe not that much risk today, but greater risk in the future, that's an area where we can be thinking about reducing that risk at the front end so that we're writing better business today and for the long haul. And that can also tie across, say, different lines of business. So, um, you know, we, while much of the, I, I know we were talking briefly about sort of climate liability earlier, much of the climate liability that has actually happened so far today has been climate liability associated with physical risks. So changes in frequency of wildfires, hazardous waste spills. So how can we, again, make sure that our clients that could potentially be affected, instead of waiting until, again, after something has happened, reaching out proactively and saying, here are some things that you could be thinking about that could help reduce your risk today and set you up for a reduced level of disaster potential in the future. Um, you would not be able to get that kind of wide ranging co-benefit unless you get the different parts of the business together and can have that kind of ferment of ideas. And we find that's really important within our organization. Great. Um, Rob, I, I have a question for you. I hope that this is in bounds, but um, so do you, I, I'm not sure if you're doing this today, do you envision a future where emissions uh, of a company will affect their, their premiums or will affect their ability to get insurance? Yeah, absolutely, John. I, I mean, I think, you know, that that does indeed occur today, right? Ultimately, the the impact that emissions and particularly the the, the relativity of that emissions relative to the industry that a client would work in and, and their plans and an evolution of what that looks like will indeed and has impacted availability for capacity, pricing, terms, coverage. Um, and I think, you know, going back to some of my comments earlier, that the key is about the understanding uh, of that relativity, as well as how that plays in a much broader spectrum of our energy transition that's incredibly important. So as you look at the, the years to come, I think it will play an increasing level uh, relative to availability of insurance coverage, as well as uh, uh, certainly how, it, how it's transacted, how it looks. And again, this is key where insurers will be differentiating themselves based on that balance of both the focus on uh, environmental, social, um, uh, and governance, but also on how you balance that transitionary plan of how emissions efficiency changes. And so um, I think it's going to be really important for insurers to help that process and to support those clients on the journey. And those who um, who are less committed to the journey um, are, are certainly going to uh, are going to be impacted as a result. Yeah, I want to emphasize that point in particular of relative to sector, right? It's the easiest thing in the world to paint with a broad brush. 
what takes sophistication but is producing more meaningful and more real outcomes is looking across a sector and saying, you know, I have I have two companies with a high emissions profile today. One has a credible transition to or a credible transition plan to move its entire book of business over to a low or zero carbon economy. It is investing in a new way of doing that business. It's investing in research. It's changing everything about what it does because that's what it has to do to adapt to a new economy. And let's say the other one is not. If you paint with a broad brush and say, I just want to exit the sector, what you have done is actually handed a competitive advantage to the company that is doing nothing. Because the other company that's trying to do the right thing, that is spending money, that is reframing its entire business, that has a real cost associated with it. And if you don't allow them to see benefit from doing all of that work, that means that their competitors essentially can free ride and not have to have to do anything. So that's where we see Liberty as a partner in transition to make sure that that transition has a clear pathway available. And we don't want to just have a knee jerk reaction. Awesome. You, I'm glad that uh, you both weighed in on that. So, Rocky, I have a little bit of a different question for you. Um, but we gathered a lot at Green Biff, so I thought I might tap into your experience. And, and Kelly and Rob, you're okay to, to weigh in as well. But, you know, ESG has really risen to the top of uh, the news cycle and to everything else. And so if someone wants to pivot their career to be more engaged in ESG, is there – are there resources or training or, or just what advice would you suggest for them to sort of make that transition in their own careers? Yeah, I mean, so I think don't be afraid. So I'm an example of somebody who got into the field right after Enron and was only the G and not the ENS. So I've I had there was no field. There was no career path for me. And I had to, you know, go where I could. And I just had this vision of what I wanted to do. Um, so um the, the now there are a lot of um i guess opportunities but my point depending on where you are whether the early parts of your career or mid or later part of your career if in the early obviously you can go to school get some kind of accreditation and start up from uh from you know different opportunities uh in a specialized field if you're in your mid and later parts of your careers particularly around mid career you already have built up a whole set of expertise. And what is happening is ESG is getting integrated into the business. By integrating the business is everybody is going to have to have ESG understanding and experience and bring it to their day-to-day -day work. We have to transform the way we are working by putting an ESG lens. So you can act, you don't have to leave your sector. You don't have to uh, stop doing your day job. You just need to really focus and conceptualize what ESG means. So first of all, get some kind of background on ESG. And I know it's it's daunting, but it's really not rocket science. So you know there are there are some very early, unlike what I had to deal with. There are some books that you can read or some very basic um, tutorials out there. Um, but once you understand it, really start thinking about your job. How is your job impacting the environment? How is the environment going to impact your job? What do you need to do to get your company to become either more green, more up for an opportunity perspective, et cetera? So it's really about taking that passion and wanting to get more involved and bringing it into your job because you're going to be helping your company in the long term. That's great. So, so Rob, how are you having that conversation with, with agents? How are you educating throughout uh, Liberty Mutual? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I, you know, I, I think it's it, it's been we're so fortunate to, given the investment of the Office of Sustainability, and again, to some extent, that evolution of underwriting that has always had a degree of ESG uh, all within all three of those pillars, but is now just advanced to another level. And so, a lot of what we're spending our time doing internally, and we'll be doing this for some time is capability building right and making sure that this is you know this isn't just a a topic that is uh that is siloed in a particular area it really is across the fabric of the organization 
comprehensive training, tailoring to sector, tailoring embedding specific processes and really delivering on that ESG ambition internally. Because the more that we do that across our almost 50,000 employees over the next few years, the better that we're able to empower um, our colleagues, our underwriters who indeed then work with our agents and brokers to really being able to apply ESG approaches um, uh, in their day-to-day -day operations. And, and I, I think the big way that we're doing it today with agents and brokers is, is informing about our ESG journey. And certainly we're grateful for Rocky and her team and uh, that of the support at the highest levels of our organization of our ESG report um, and that which for 2021 was just released. But it's a lot about having that conversation, understanding the relatability to what we're seeing at Liberty versus what's going on in our agents and our customers business. And so a lot of his communication, John, and to Rocky's point, it's getting that base level of understanding. And it often relates a little bit back to Kelly's comments on that avoids the, you know, sometimes maybe knee jerk reactions or, or, or what can sometimes be an illogical approach to support customers in the next phase. And I'm excited that capability building to some extent has only just begun. And we, we have lots of good work ahead of us in, in the years uh, that, that follow for, again, for agents, brokers and clients. And the people who have really come to be the most effective in their ESG careers are just to, to lean into a point that Rocky mentioned earlier, taking advantage of the skill sets that you already have. Because if you have a deep understanding of the business in which you operate, and now you can apply a lens of the changing risk environment that we all operate within. That puts you in an incredible position to identify not just risks, but opportunities, ways that you can write better business, ways that you can differentiate yourself from your competitors. And in, in the insurance industry, we understand that climate and other ESG related risks affect us soup to nuts. Every portion of our business is now going to be operating under this new framework. So people who can bring that lens and say, this is where I can identify how we can do the business that we do today better, those are the people who are the most effective in the ESG space. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, we are just about running out of time. And so I wanna thank all of you for, for such a good conversation and thank our sponsor, Liberty Mutual, for making this webcast happen. Um, if you'd like to rewatch this webcast, the recording will be archived on greenbiz.com later today, and our team will email you the link once it's available. You can also check out the resources on this topic by clicking on the resource button on your screen. This includes the Liberty Mutual website, their ESG review, their TCFD report, and then you can also uh, subscribe to our Greenfin weekly newsletter, which provides updates on the latest ESG and sustainable finance news and trends. And there's a link to register for Greenfin 22, the premier ESG event, aligning the sustainability, finance, and investment communities. That'll occur June 28th and 29th in New York City. So if you'd like to watch more GreenBiz webcasts, please visit www.greenbiz.com slash webcasts. Um, I really want to thank Kelly, Rob, Rocky. This has been a really great conversation, a lot of fun. And on behalf of my colleagues at GreenBiz, thanks for joining us today. I'm John Davies. Until next time, have a great day.